Welcome everybody to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar at Stanford University, which is a seminar for aspiring students, aspiring founders at Stanford. ETL, or the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar, is presented by STVP, the, S the Stanford Engineering Entrepreneurship Center, and BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. I am Ravi Balani, a lecturer in the Management Science and Engineering Department at Stanford, and the director of Alchemist, an accelerator for enterprise startups. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Sharon Prince to ETL. You know, we wanted to kick off the spring with a true catalyst for change, and we couldn't be more happy than to have Sharon kick off the spring quarter. Sharon Prince is the CEO and founder of Grace Farms Foundation, which is a new kind of boundary-defining public space in New Canaan, Connecticut, that has become widely known as a global humanitarian and cultural center. Grace Farms is the platform for the foundation and its interdisciplinary humanitarian mission to pursue peace through nature, arts, justice, community, faith, and design for freedom, a global new movement to eliminate forced labor from the building materials supply chain. Since opening, Grace Farms has garnered numerous prestigious awards for contributions to architecture, environmental sustainability, and social good, including the AIA National 2017 Architecture Honor Award and the Mies Crown Hall America's Prize. Sharon also co-founded Grace Farms Foods, which offers coffees and teas that demonstrate what the foundation advocates for ethical and sustainable supply chains. And I think there may be some mm -hmm. that you guys all are going to get the benefit. You can be the beneficiaries of tasting some, which is in the back of the room here. And for those that are in 178, you're going to get even some more privileged gifts. Um, and 100% of the profits from Grace Farms Food supports the Design for Freedom movement to eliminate forced labor from the building materials supply chain and the construction industry. Um, in recognition of Sharon's impactful work, Fast Company has named her to the, its list of the most creative people in business 2022 for cleaning up construction. And the AIA New York and Center for Architecture rec recognized her for the NYC, the New York City Visionary Award. Please join me, everybody, in welcoming Sharon Prince. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It is such an honor to open your ETL series with you, Ravi, and all of your uh, all of you art engineering and entrepreneurial students who are really thinking about how to create new things. And as you can think about architecture, which is inherently creating new things. What is so surprising, fascinating, and underrealized is the power, the enormous power of architecture to drive new outcomes, and even humanitarian outcomes. As a fellow entrepreneur, I think of architecture as a three-dimensional expression of a vision. And the one th other thing is that you think about architecture, space, and I do believe, does communicate. So you start to wrestle with this idea, but what does space communicate? And, and also, you know, can it embed values into space? Can you do that? Can it be generative over 100 years? Now, what can it do? Well, I'm going to share with you three, three creations that are all starting with a place. It is Grace Farms. This is Grace Farms. It is, like you said, situated on 80 acres. One of the first things was to preserve the land that was slavery broken up. And uh, then from this, you'll see the river building. It's a porous building. It also tests the limits of engineering innovations, which I'll get into, but also creates proximities. And in terms of creating proximities, that includes people, sectors, and the whole concept to advance good in the world through nature, arts, justice, community, and faith actually worked on me because our investment in architecture to do just this and our commitment in terms of justice really create an epiphany for me that initialized the design for freedom movement. And the other aspect is of like, okay, now that you know, you can't unknow it and I have to think about all the materials are we using when we bring them into site now because that epiphany happened after the whole concept was before we built Grace Farms. So those teas and coffees are the other avenue with my co-founder to demonstrate what we're advocating for. And that is ethical and sustainable supply chains. So now I remember starting off as an entrepreneur 
like you, I was in college, just many years ago, it was at the University of Tulsa, I was putting myself through school, and I was the graduate assistant in what was a new entrepreneurial studies department. Dr. Hisrick was a Rhodes Scholar and was the foremost expert on entrepreneurism. He had just written a book on women entrepreneurs. I was like, wow, okay, gender parity. It's coming, it's right here. Uh, not so much. This is almost more than 30 years ago, right? And this is what I've been working on too, gender and racial parity, being able to do that. So part of the, the um, concept that I employ in terms of being an entrepreneur is being immersed. It's a little different than being passionate and obsessed, which yes, <laughs> probably like you am that too, but immersion is necessarily present and active. And when you're immersed, you start to see the, um, is the gaps in society that you might want to, to, to be able to address. You also see opportunities. And when you're immersed, you're also enveloped in a way that you're creating all the senses, right? That you can start to see connections. So I uh, found my, this is, this is me at Stanford 30 years ago. This is the first time I'm at Stanford. <laughs> and if you can see there, it is the 1994 uh, World Cup is my first soccer match, so you can tell I'm really all in, even though it's my first soccer match. And I had 36 hours to get here, so I said yes. You gotta be present, you gotta say yes and show up. I did that. And uh, I happened to also be an outdoor adventurer. So I love to drive fast, and I uh, started, let's say, I think it's, so I started at six years old, water skiing, about seven or eight, riding dirt bikes, and still have my motorcycle license. And uh, this is Iceland, back in 2003, so now a d decade later, in Iceland, I thought about, oh, it's so exciting to be able to like go full throttle on, on, and on a glacier, go full throttle on a, on, a, on a snowmobile, at the same time you could dip into a hot spring. Well, at that time, uh, I got there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, I never saw, but mostly what you saw at that time was very boxy, North Face, no ads with women in it. And this is what I saw when I got to Iceland at that time. So cool, right? But what I also saw back here in the United States on the right is, is an advertisement that I literally just found preparing for this. The same magazine that when I did get the brand, I got the brand of 66 Degree North, brought to the United States. I got the North American distribution rights. And I just love this because introducing the winter collection, also known as a summer collection. And at that time, we, I brought it into the United States. It was in Urban Outfitters, Paragon Sports, a little bit of fashion. Uh, also, Paragon Sports being a very outdoor active place. And then what you see on the right is what I was dealing with, right? It is, uh, let's see, if you get it, yes, bring warmth to cold places, ex-girlfriends not included. Okay, that's not exactly what I wanted to see, so you, you're trying to fill those gaps. And also, when you're an entrepreneur, you're scrappy. Of course you're scrappy. You gotta figure, you have no budget, you have no, you're figuring out how, what to do. Well, I, when I brought the brand to the United States, I just called up the Wall Street Journal, did not have a PR firm, called them up, said, I'm bringing this brand to the United States. They did assign a reporter. The reporter came with me for four days, and I mean, how, fantastic, right? Well. Not so much either. As you know, there's a plethora of, of challenges that you're going to face. In fact, I think there's probably an infinite amount. But I, what happens, um, the way I think about it is that there's always going to be a challenge of the day. And then I look for the good news of the day. It literally has been my practice for 17 years, just every single day. In this case, it was a bit of, more of a challenge than you might than I thought, because I was really, really riding high on this idea that I was bringing the Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, they sold out the company. I did not own the company. I got the North American distribution rights. Did not own the company. They sold it out from underneath me. I had the right of first refusal in my contract, and uh, yet I'm not Icelandic. <laughs> so they sold it. Now I have a choice. There's a day before I'm literally getting on the plane. I have a choice to, to file a breach of contract lawsuit, or do I make sure I get into the headquarters now and bring the Wall Street Journal reporter with all that I had invested in? So. What happened is I got the report and I did do both. So, <laughs> so now I'm the next stage is to I'm developing retail stores. And the architect friend of mine who was helping, the, helping us uh, to develop these retail stores, I'm about to now roll out retail stores. 
And the Soho store went so well, it was actually profitable. Think about a pop-up store for three months, for a couple months, profitable. Crazy, right? Uh, had a dance party, basically, in, the, <laughs> in Soho uh, with Icelandic DJs. It was really fun. And uh, okay, this is now 2007. Only problem is I did not own the, the, the full, I'm not vertically integrated, right? I also did not own the brand, did not have a margin. The terrace went up, didn't have a margin. I mean, that, that's, that, was, uh, that was not, that eliminated the possibility uh, for me to stay in that company, so I divested. Good news of the day is that Iceland, that not good for Iceland, but good for me divesting when I did, is that Iceland went bankrupt. How often does that happen? Okay, so I mean, I can tell you a thousand stories like this that are just crazy, right? But what I did adopt from that, and without 66 Degree North, I would not have created Grace Farms. There's no way, because this concept of Space Communicates was derived from that. It's also about experiencing nature with the awe and wonder. There were so many aspects, including the owner's project manager that I hired that was a colleague um, through this process too. And um, he was the one that had built Guggenheim, built Bow, didn't answer my calls originally, but then we started working together as sort of like his pet project. And so now, of course, his favorite. So the concept that I want you to really think about, again, is that architecture space is a three-dimensional uh, expression of a vision. And it does, even if you're unconsciously doing so, it still expresses a vision. And we now have this opportunity to reimagine architecture as a driver of humanitarian outcomes, and even to be this entrepreneurial platform. All right, so here's the first expression of Grace Farms. It is a really cool expression. In fact, it won an AIA New York Merit Award for unbuilt work. And yet, my role as the entrepreneur is to mark to market the vision and how it's being expressed. So I had a 35-page program that was highly aspirational and also utilitarian needs. So after two years of development, I had to abandon the project because it did not achieve the goal. <laughs> That's very, it's very tough to do. However, uh, knowing that this was gonna be a long-term project, went through a whole search to find the right architect now that I could pair with. This is an image of Sejima and Nishizawa of Sana in Japan. The reason why they are, were so perfect, and it was a long, pro it's another process just in terms of selecting them, but they were never tethered to existing models. And what we're creating is a new kind of public place. There was not a place like this um, that was not only in terms of form, but in terms of concept. And so they could think in that abstract way. And, uh, and you can see here too that when we were, it was an iterative process. So I am proposing concepts like we want to create an environment where you are experiencing nature, where nature's in the foreground and the buildings recedes. They took that further. You can see here that the building becomes part of the landscape. And also other things like we want to create a place that evoke curiosity, new perspectives, create an individual experience and a collective experience. And it just goes on like, okay, very uh, peaceful respite and an active community, diametrically opposed. And there was many of those. So now here we are, it's a equestrian, former equestrian site. And now we start to develop, I'll show you a couple of the images that allow you to see that we, re we retained two of the barns. So in terms of reuse and remodeling, very effective in terms of design for freedom, because you start to truncate the supply chain at the extractives reducing the risk of exploitation. And it ends up being the only opaque spaces that we had, which were very you know, advantageous as well. And then we are, Grace Farms is the only, only site in Connecticut that is both uh, lead certified for how we built and also how we operate. So demonstrating what we're advocating for is always in our mind. Okay, how do we, we of course, had a, uh, decide to have a, a garden so we could, produce, we could have the produce that we would also have on site, but also be able to donate, and as a place. So here we are, really, again, immersed in nature, the arts, all these aspects that I was describing. One is to experience nature, to encounter the arts, and the arts meaning visual, performing, culinary, and so forth. 
to pursue justice. This is Dr. McQuaggy, Nobel Peace Prize winner on the right, and Nicholas Kristof on the left. And to foster community, this is actually the sanctuary at the top of the river that you can see has no stairs because it makes it become part of the landscape. Many aspects, it was, it was each chair is individually designed. The height of the stage is determined so that it becomes a more egalitarian space and that you yet see into the, into the landscape. Foster community. Here is the commons, the center of the five glass enclosed volumes that you can see people now have to sit with each other. There's no option. There's a few others on the side. And you can see these tables were made from wood that was felled on site. That was part of the sustainable <laughs> endeavor, but also it, by doing so, it also reduces human exploitation because we know our supply chain and using local locally fabricated materials in the United States, and actually if you know where they are, even wherever you are, it's, it, it's uh, advantageous. And then in terms of being able to advance good in the world, explore faith because of you know, people of all faith backgrounds, are, are, you can um, start to examine, you know, how can we do this together from a faith perspective? And this image I love because it shows you the hopeful space. We're, we're meant to also, in terms of the space, being able to address pressing humanitarian issues. So we wanted to create a light-filled space that had both spiritual potential and social potential. And you can see here, um, there's many divine interventions that happen along the way. So now the process, what is the process in terms of creating that you can apply to many of the, of the creations you're involved in and will be? It starts with not knowing, and also it starts with creating many, many options. So this is in their studio in Japan, and what I love about this is that there was never, the answer was always, we study, we will study. Not an answer that you would, not a, a linear answer. And it was a really fun process to be going back and forth with them iteratively, but also they had the same way of being in terms of being immersed. So after we selected the river building, it wasn't called the river building, it was actually the solution to a set of, uh, you know, set of requirements, the architecture directive. And it part of, we selected the river building, I thought, okay, it's done. And no, it was like literally many, many years all the way up to the finish line while you're still iterating back and forth. The, the, uh, that image of, the, of Teshima is in, in Japan where they said, okay, now go out, out and see some of our other projects. I've now probably seen 15 so that I can understand how they were interpreting that architecture, again, being immersed. So this is the interior. You can see how it was situated on the hill, but the interior, this is a mind-blowing project. One art installation, and this is just opening when I took that picture. And then some other elements, so you start to think about materiality. And this is really intentional. It's not a very clear, it's more of a, a blurred, reflective space here so that everyone has their own entryway, their own entree in. And then this is a really important part of selecting them is that I could see on the left that is, is this as if you're walking out in nature and you also can be having this experience all together, that long bench I loved. And then on the right, the use of glass, super fascinating. But what I saw here is that the glass was green and did not quite love that. I still like the clarity. And now the process. So this is a moment where I had to let a Sejima Nishizawa know that the order of operations, this, we'd already been two years now into development, about to go into construction documents. And as we're examining, I, I did not see a rendering for two years. So I really highly encourage something along those ways where you're not along the way, where you're not tethered to existing like, materials that you're starting, like in here you can see what we're doing is, I'm determining whether proximities are right, the atmospheric uh, elements, not, not really concerned about whether that material, sure it comes later, but first are we, is the order of operations right? Are the, uh, and, and, I, and I, at first I thought, when are we gonna see a rendering? And now I realized like that was elemental to producing the outcome. And then you'll see here too, 
that there are many iterations. And I can look at this as an art piece actually at Grace Farms that, that helps you see the, all the variations of all the decision making along the way. But I did have to tell them that the order was out. It was, was uh, not, a, not according, it was not achieving the goal because the tonality was intended to be both peaceful and, and active, but the way that the volumes ended up being positioned, it was peaceful. And I realized, oh, it's active, peaceful, active. It achieved many other goals, but it did not achieve that. So we had to switch those. And that was a huge deal to do that. If you, when you're in construction, no, no, it's like not a, not a good thing. It had to re-engineer the whole roof. It took about six months to make that change of just changing the order of the volumes. But again, you really need to know and be confident in your vision of what you're trying to create. And you have to articulate what beforehand. It can't, you, know, you have, to have to articulate the values you want to also embed, the team members that you want on your, you, know, you want to be a part of your team. And uh, I think that's, it, it was a really important way of being able to determine uh, whether or not we were going to, okay, oh. Okay, this other one too, I wanna to show you is that this is there's rarely a form of building like this where it again becomes part of the landscape, but this elevation change afforded many of those aspirational ideas, just the elevation change. So that you have these sight lines all along the river. You're, you're also even curious. Now, if it's glass, like what's happening here? What's happening over there versus opacity? And we, I asked for ambulatory experience because when you're moving, you're creating, you're creating new perspectives. Okay, so I had the, uh, the whole, the, the whole now, now we have the right order, the project's ready to go, we're about to go into construction, and lo and behold, another challenge. This is, there's many, this is just one of them. And this is, uh, well, I, I really want green, we, we definitely value green energy. We have 55 geothermal wells that power the river building. I just didn't want to see in the landscape a cell tower 150 feet with a windmill on top. So about 10 lawyers from a top communications company was coming in to make this happen. And there was uh, state laws to proceed local. And I had to go up against 10 of those lawyers myself. So pay attention in your business law. <laughs> Definitely do, I use it all the time. And uh, what happened is that just prior to that one rendering, that one rendering did emerge and Architects newspaper identified Grace Farms as an architectural gem. So I use that in my defense because that was one of the rulings that said if there's a treasured property, then those cell towers um, are not premier, or have a, a way out. So you, you have to be, you know, always, <laughs> you're on deck is the point. You're gonna be on deck, so be prepared. And the, then you go into building. So now prototyping, right? In architecture, it's one-to-one. -one, huge, it, these models, many models on site determine whether this material is going to reflect the sky, make the building become part of the landscape. And now the glass. So we spent two years also on glass. And the glass, now I go over to Shenzhen to take a look at the glass. Here we are. We have over 200 individually curved and sized glass panels that need to be clear in order to see the landscape. And so when I'm there, they were very excited, this is it. And I let, had let them know that, no, it's not clear enough. We're not gonna go through all this and not have clear glass. Their response, they were one of the best, like literally top glass folks, and actually Michael Ra was here from front at Grace Farms uh, just a couple of weeks ago and discussed it again. What's interesting is that we didn't create a new type of glass after that because that was pushing, that was, we were at the, already the limits of what we could do in terms of creating the glass system in the Northeast that would, that would be able to withstand temperature and had all the um, R factors that we need. So we uh, instead, Sejima and Nishizawa worked with everyone and created a, a, an altered the design. So we extended the roof and took off the laminate. And so therefore, with that simple solution, right? Uh, what I didn't realize until just a couple of weeks ago, I forgot, is that by removing the laminate, you're now removing, removing a contaminant, and now that glass can be recycled. It's not recycled right now, just so you know. So the flat glass right now is generally not recycled because of those contaminants. And 
And so not the recycling this, but you can see like all these, some of these are just pushing up, asking the questions uh, about how to improve and, and also to re really to reach the goal. This is what typical mullions look like. The separators, you can see it, it says a black one on top and did not want to see a black one. I did not want to see a black uh, separator and uh, system there. So we actually reduced the size of the spacer. These are your double glass, this is an IGU unit, and reduce it by 55%. So you see the gray below, really wanted clear, but I had to compromise it gray. So we had, to, like, that was what they, they commercially we could end up doing and make it warrantable. And then we had these mock ups. So here's a large scale mock up, and we're still testing and testing, but we did achieve the goal. And you, here it is. So you can see all along the river. Okay, in construction, uh, let's see. I have, okay, okay, this is it. Take one quick sip. All right, so now we're in construction, and I am super fascinated with the whole process. I had never built anything, by the way. I also never had a retail store. Mm -hmm. I think you're in a great position because you're not tethered to any models or anything. This is where you have so much promise. You don't need the experience. You need to actually know it, it, what's so valuable is knowing what you're trying to achieve. So in this case, I uh, was not invited to the construction site meetings. I, as an owner, usually not, and certainly not invited on the site. I was there every week and I loved it. I mean, come on, it's just, look at that. It is it's so super cool to see all the materials and even in, in our case, they were voluminous and that actually informed design for freedom because I understood even though this, this building looks so light on the land, it was, had the, the volume of materials was mesmerized. It was quite a lot. In this case, I had just been to Sundance and I was like, wait a minute, we have arts. How are we gonna show any film in a, in a uh, glass building, right? So in the middle in situ, we re, uh, had to take the footings out and created a space in the lower level. And always immersed, I think a little too immersed here, but <laughs> I got mud up to my thighs. Uh, but I love this image because now you see these are inverted egg crates. That it was a system that we brought in from, from Europe. It's not really, so hopefully it's gonna be more adopted because you're using less concrete. And uh, as you pour it over and then the, the airflow, it acts like a radiant floor and the air flows out to the perimeter grills. So, what I see here too is we have cold rolled steel, you have FSC certified wood. FSC certified wood uh, at that time did not include fair labor inputs, it does now. But it certainly reduces again the exposure to forced labor in the supply chain when there's more inspection of it. Now, here's old school modeling. We had to determine the height of the stage, literally just for that, just getting out our, uh, you know, you, you see in the background too, there's just cutouts of people making sure you can see, but again, determining that height of the stage. Okay, I love, I, I think even since I was little, I loved, I loved uh, walking on a roof. So this was actually very informative because now I understood how the roof was being designed. What you see is this beautiful, you know, beautiful roof, but I was able to see how it was even made by engaging, right? By being on the roof. And then in this case, that might, it does look beautiful. It, it, to achieve this is also, it took, it went to the extremes because normally you have protrusions in a roof. We even had to create a totem for the exhaust of the kitchen that was in the landscape, like another a whole section. So, uh, Kazuya Sejima and Rue Nishizawa as immersed and obsessed to ensure that we were reaching the goal. Now under underneath the flooring, uh, we, I started to activate the space with the arts to warm it up. So it's inherent in the whole the atmosphere and the volume of it. We had an artist come and we're just using nature, arts and so forth. Also invited dancers. I don't think I, I don't know that again, OSHA rules and all these other things I was applying here, but, um, how cool, right? And so this is the court, that last volume that I didn't speak about. It is a, the glass is, uh, you can see is the, the perimeter at the top, so it's light filled and it's submerged. So it's submerged into the landscape. On the left also has, we, there still now, is an art piece. And uh, both, the, Marcus Miller is on the right. He is a 
Jim Dennis, a Harvard mathematician who was just starting embarking, this is 10 years ago, 2004, on his uh, journey to be, a, he decided to, to go into um, being a saxophone player professionally. Right now, he's playing with John Batiste, and he's also our music director. So when you're creating something new, our team are all entrepreneurial, but all, there's never been a specific job that would align up typically, right? And so the potential of people uh, to contribute was really enormous and fun, and we could also think about how we're gonna create that team. And here we, here's that, here, at this point, uh, before we open, not only inviting the arts to, you know, to be a part of the place, also had our stake in the ground in terms of justice, and that is to end modern day slavery. And we've had this point, in, within the first year, we had the UN University come, also inviting a more multi-sectoral group, and we, off, we had a report that went to the UN Security Council and passed, 2331. And that, so now what's happening? So much, there's like, and all happening simultaneously. So people have a chance to engage as they choose. That outcome I'm describing, Design for Freedom, this is at our summit just two weeks ago, and we had 550 come. Just to be super clear, this is not, a, <laughs> this is under, we're undertaking, uh, you're taking on the entire construction sector and creating this radical paradigm shift to remove forced and child labor from the building material supply chain. And it takes, you know, it's, it, it takes a whole industry to become a part of that. And that's what we did. The built environment does have a relationship to nature and people. And the question that brought people around the table is, is your building ethically sourced, forced labor free, as well as sustainably designed as a question I asked, end of 2017, beginning of 2018, to get people on board, and the answer is we don't know. If you look around here, you don't know where these materials are made from. You have, there's, it, unlike even clothing, you know the provenance, you might not know who, but you know, oh, I've, I know the origin and a piece of clothing, but you don't know, and these are materials that are highly fraught. So, uh, the one thing to note is that we're, uh, with construction, you think about labor, but it's mainly on the job site. What's been, the whole sector's been given a labor transparency pass <laughs> on the material procurement side, and half of the cost of a building is the material procurement. So construction is the largest industry that is, uh, that has the largest industrialized industry at risk of forced and child labor. It's also the most egregious violator of carbon emissions at 37%, and they do go together. And we can talk about that another time, why that relationship, you might be studying that. But the size of the industry, nearly 14 trillion in consumer spending and in spending globally, and at, there are new numbers that just came out of estimates of the illicit profits that are being earned by subsidizing with forced labor, 236 billion, of which that's on modern slavery, of which 63 are derived, 63 billion dollars derived uh, from forced labor. At that time, there were no, there was no list of materials, and this is literally only five, six years ago, right? Five, five 2018, uh, at the beginning, no list of the materials. So we issued that, and I also, I'll explain how that happened because we started to, and before I do. The most important thing is people, not the numbers. Is we have, there's 28 million people in forced labor conditions around the world estimated, likely more, and it's been escalating. The last um, estimate that was revealed was, two, was 25 million a few years ago, five years ago, and it's escalating. It's not decreasing, even with more knowledge, right, about supply chains and forced labor. Here's that list of materials. That, that literally some of them have long-standing histories of forced labor, rubber, you might be studying these in different ways, but rubber, glass, fiber, textiles, steel, electronics, bricks, think about it, right? It's crazy. Uh, timber and copper, stone, <laughs> so you read the rest of them, um, iron, minerals, and polysilicon. Okay, that's, these are at-risk materials and you are not, we're not expecting our supply chain. Now, solar panels, you saw polysilicon is fraught. I mean, it definitely is. Uh, solar panels are not sustainable if they're subsidized with forced labor and made with that. 
So I know you're working on projects. That, okay, this is a, a very important concept because 35 to 45% of all the pillage silicon in the world is being sourced from the Uyghur region of China, but that's not the only at-risk material. You have steel, copper, aluminum, glass. Glass, also, when I described that before, there are no third-party audited um, certifications for glass that include fair labor. There are for many others that we put in our toolkit. So now we also see some low-hanging fruit, right? There's been, I said, first food is called to be accountable, then clothing, next to shelter. Clothing has already been accountable, and there are certain transparency uh, you know, certifications that have been put into play. There's more, there's, there's, there's more transparency in that sector. So now we're looking to take that sector uh, and that accountability and convert that into interiors. So are they, you know, curtains, chairs, carpet, right? Just the textiles alone from that, from the garment industry, we can convert, and we're doing that. There also, now the question that I got quite often is like, I've already, and you might be thinking it's just like, I've already, there's so many, like lead certification, I'm not just lead, but to, in um, so being sustainable takes a lot of effort and it actually costs more quite often. And so people ask me, is this gonna cost more? You know, is this gonna cost more now that I have to you know, now go through this process to be ethically sourced? And in my head, I'm thinking that is crazy because you know, I'm not going to accept uh, subsidizing our ROIs with slavery. So that's what I was saying. I was saying, oh, look, we're subsidizing our ROIs with slavery. And the response was, okay, now when you're developed, so in terms of trying to tell you, like, explain how to create a movement, in this case, it have to, it's also creating some succinct language that can help to be adopted more broadly. So instead, to, uh, converted that thinking and says it can cost more, are we willing to accept the slavery discount? I'm not willing to do that. So I want to show you the, um, the key factor here. When we say challenging really fair market value. Fair market value is not fair. It's not the current price if it's subsidized with forced labor. Another way to think about it is that if the fair market value with fair labor is here and the market price that it's really the fair market price up here with fair, with fair labor. And the, but the market price is here without inspection. You don't know, it may or may not. That delta is the slavery discount. So that's a term that uh, is starting to be adopted. I proposed that about um, more broadly a year ago. And now the good news of the movement is starting to be adopted. And another thing about building a movement, okay, high, from the very get-go, the urgency of this situation uh, really made me think about having the full ecosystem to really come together, right? It's not just one sector that's responsible. So these, you'll see in, the, in blue, it might be a little difficult. Well, you can see it, yeah. Um, these are the pressure points that you do have agency. So whether it be owners and developers, there's an owner's project requirement. You could, you could say you can't actually right now have a fully uh, ethical supply chain without forced labor, but you can determine a subset. And you have media is important in terms of awareness, government agencies on contracts and extractives and manufacturers obviously documenting. As a university, being able to uh, initialize research, which I'll tell you about is happening at at Stanford right now. And then the public demand, right? That's a very important part of the equation. So bringing people around the table and the, the idea from the get-go is that we need CEOs and, and industry leaders to be a part of the working group because we want them to be able to make immediate decisions. And how does that happen? You ask them. So <laughs> everything that, most everything, it sounds like, oh, you had like, credit connections. No, I asked those who built Grace Farms. And then I asked them to say, who else do you know? Let's ask them. And we're going to have gender parity on this, uh, in looking at, at in also in terms of gender and racial parity, trying to include, make sure that's part of our concept of how we want to create that team. And did so. And then, uh, and then the next part that's really important, too, is to have you as university students, I'm really, this is a gift to be here because the, you as university students are able to imagine the future, but like I said, without being tethered. And 
where now they've been engaged with probably 25 universities. And, uh, and I think it's a very important part of being able to, you know, for you to carry the, the baton. So our first industry report, we formally launched the movement 2020. And those working group members, 30 of them, were part of that, our part of it, you can see it in the, in the report. And then people ask, okay, just tell me the, just tell me which one of those materials are made without forced labor. Well, <laughs> we're at the beginning of the movement. We need the transparency. So we did start to say, okay, you have to use a toolkit. It's not gonna be a certification out there already. We're, we have to create it. We have to start to, um, we developed a toolkit for the industry to start using, and they are. And then our creative director, Chelsea Thatcher, set, is one of the co-authors on the report, along with the former ambassador on modern slavery. She said, okay, what are we gonna do next? Again, asking the questions, what's next? So okay, now we need to have a uh, pilot project. So here they are. They're in locations on three different continents. This is in three years time, three continents. And that means you have to get the whole team, like an owner, the architect, engineer, con construction managers to agree to do this. And, um, and so we had three continents, 12 projects. And one really beautiful project that aligns is Shadow of a Face with Nina Cook John, which is a, the Harriet Tubman Monument that replaced Christopher Columbus Monument. See that shadow of face, it's, it's really extraordinary. And Black Chapel, again, limited materials in London at the beginning. And then we had a full scale project in the Canadian Library, Turner Construction's on this project. And you'll see how now they have adopted Design for Freedom and are committed, as well as Miller Knoll, a top firm too. And then the bridge in India. This is now a bigger project, a million square feet. And it's with one of the large, uh, one of the key industrialists there, Sunil Manjal, in India, where there is the highest number of those in enslaved conditions. So it's pretty bold to do that too. And then our team's now starting to get RFPs for new projects. One of them that we just announced, we announced five new ones last week at the summit. And uh, Kar Karsh Institute of Democracy for the University of Virginia is on board. You can th imagine the capacity we're gonna have to, to accelerate the movement. And Design for Freedom Ethical Supply Chain Workshop, Turn Construction and State Department OBO said, you've gotta bring suppliers to the table. And I said, you're the one who has all the suppliers. So let's co-host a working group, which we did just November and have a report now that we also published last month. Now, this is the main concept I, ho I hope that um, you'll carry with you along with the slavery discount is that um, we need to ethically decarbonize. We're at a point in time now where we're already myopically focused on, let's say, you know, on materials in terms of, of embodied carbon. And what we've left out of the equation is embodied suffering. And so this is the time now, this next step, I coined, we coined the term Anna Dyson from the Yale Center for Ecosystems and Architecture, and I coined this term, and that was just in September, and now the press is already picking it up, and we're already starting to ha have that in mindful because it's important because as we're decarbonizing, we have to determine who is making these materials. So we are accelerating the movement through the summit that just happened. 550 came, important to tell you because we had 75 students from 30 universities and on the left is your Sarah Billington, who is the chair of the civil and environmental engineering department here and I don't know if Antonio's here, but the Antonio, so great. He is a PhD student who has now initialized a Design for Freedom um, research project. Listen how cool this is, to trace and understand the provenance of concrete. Don't know if this has ever been done anywhere else. It just, right, this is incredible. And in the middle is uh, students from Pratt. And they are, they're architecture students with uh, Kai Uwe Bergman, who I also just invited to be part of the working group. He's, uh, they, they operate in 40 countries and they, uh, it's pretty exceptional. But what they said, the students said this last week, a couple weeks ago, is just that, they said, why is this part of our curriculum? And I want you to know that Sarah is already hoping to make that happen here at Stanford. And on the right is Princeton students with our structural engineer, Nat Oppenheimer. This is happening today which is, this is one of the panels that we had. It was called Navigating to Yes with the ACE team and legal. 
And on the left, uh, next to me, is Sarah, uh, is uh, Leslie King. She's a killer construction lawyer. Been working with her for a number of years, and then then part of the working group too. Thing that's so important about this now is thinking, how can we get this into contracts? So on today's loop with all of us, so I'll have to talk up to chime in when I when I'm done with this. But uh, we're trying to wrestle with the dilemma that persists between between being compliant with existing laws. There are now laws. I'm not going into that, but there's laws that are now making us accountable, and the capacity to be in compliance. It's a big dilemma, right? But now we have great minds on it and working on it together. We also now want to initialize a public demand. And so with every fiber is a, an exhibit that we're opening next month. And it does include Nina Cook John again. And in the middle from Pentagram, we're working with Eddie for 12 years and Anna Dyson from Yale. This is the exhibit. And not only are we going to create an understanding of the materials that are fraught, but there's a bio wall there that is really going to be extraordinary. You'll see that in, when you come, hopefully. But we're going to, um, it shows the future, right, of materials. And then lastly, our, our Grace Farms teas and coffees, which I hope you get a chance to taste. But it's important, we're demonstrating what we're advocating for, B Corp, and it is a new structure that is wholly owned by the, the foundation that gives back 100% to Design for Freedom. So this is again an entry point for the public to engage and even learn about Design for Freedom. You'll see that logo on the back. And this is in Darjeeling, which uh, is considered Darjeeling tea, the champagne of tea, again, immersed. And so I just really, really invite you to be able to think about the agency you have to create a more humane future. And also note that we all do have agency to design for freedom. That's it. That was, that was so, so, so terrific. Um, we, I know we're coming up on, we, we're almost at the end of the, of the allotted time. And so if there are any burner questions, uh, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I may just take the liberty of asking a question myself, <laughs> which is, you know, I think one of the biggest gifts, Sharon, of this class is, is that the students get to feel the agents of change, you know, firsthand. And I think one thing that's so self-evident, I, th I think everybody can feel this, is the, the buoyant confidence that you have. You know, th this is a narrative of like all entrepreneurial journeys of, of challenges. Uh, but I'm curious, <laughs> is that confidence something that you cultivate? Are there practices that you do that you, that you mm -hmm. treasure now that you wish you knew of when you began? Um, or were you just born with this, <laughs> this um, effervescent energy to overcome challenges? I, I really believe that it's a micro um, every day stands that you take, and I do that all the time. I mean, I do that, it's just every week. I, I, I said examples of like, okay, a bank account um, puts uh, the male's name first instead of the female, me. When my husband's on my, it's like, no, it's my, me first, not him. And I have literally been write all new checks. I, I mean, there's just like, there's little microaggressions, you know, that people, are, that I think are improper, like that's not how it should be. So that's just one example of a thousand, but it's just since I, I don't know, just every, it's a practice and I just do it all, all, all every, really almost every day, it seems like. <laughs> There's like a correct, like you're trying to help see in a positive way, okay, no, here, this is, um, there's a better way forward. With mm -hmm. even small acts, just getting energized for, for taking action on small acts. And then I also noticed that you were saying that every day you're, 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 you're conscious about what was good that day. Yes. So, yes. Oh, that's super important. No, because you'll not, you will not. And actually there are, when you're looking for, when you're looking for the good news of the day, which does happen, you have to look for it. It doesn't, it's, it's sometimes not obvious. So I literally say, okay, and the good news of the day is, and the good news. So and I, you're saying that to yourself. I or do. You're writing and I say it out loud. You say though. it out loud to yourself. No, no, I say it to whoever's within oh, okay. six feet. I see. You know, okay. So. <laughs> okay. so, no, I literally do. It's like, and the good news of the day is, X, you know, and Y. Well, the good news for us today is that we had you, Sharon, <laughs> kick off ETL. So thank you. I have to draw it to a close because we're out of time. Um, but thank you all for joining us for the kickoff. Next week, we're going to have Kazar Yunus, who's the CEO of Applied Intuition, joining us. And you can find this talk and others on our YouTube channel. It's the eCorner YouTube channel. And um, more materials you can find at eCorner.stanford.edu. So thank you all for joining. Um, thank you for having me.